What happens when we create machines that are as or more intelligent than we are? What are the possible timelines, implications, and ways forward to ensure we create the most positive future for our world? In this first sequence on timelines, we're looking at how these machines might be built and when that might happen. In later episodes, we'll dig more deeply into the implications of AGI and how we can, we, we can work to ensure they work to benefit our world. This is The AGI Show, and I'm your host, Saroosh Paul. Jack Kendall is our guest today. He is the CTO of Rain Neuromorphics, a company which has the stated mission to build a brain. To do that, they are building custom chips that can do training and inference of neural networks, many orders of magnitude more efficiently than today's best processes for ML, a key bottleneck for creating in silico machine intelligence. At the Nino Research Group at the University of Florida, Jack invented a new method for connecting artificial silicon neurons using coaxial nanowires, and that became the basis for what's now Rain Neuromorphics. Jack's life mission has been to discover the secrets of intelligence and how we can invent generally intelligent systems. So you can see why he's an amazing person for us to be speaking with today about timelines and pathways to AGI. Welcome, Jack. Thanks so much for having me. Um, Really, really great to have you here with us. Tell us just a little bit about yourself and specifically maybe um, your work in the world of artificial intelligence. What have you been up to, you know, kind of what drives you and what have you been up to in the space? Yeah, sure. Uh, so I'm primarily an AI researcher, uh, but unlike most AI researchers, my work focuses on the physical aspects of neural circuits and how we can build them into, for example, silicon hardware. So my goal is really to build new processor architectures that work more like the brain. So rather than simulating neural circuits using a CPU or a GPU, uh, like people normally do today, uh, we'd like to actually build these, these neural networks, these neural circuits, directly into silicon. Something that really fundamentally drives me as well is understanding the brain in general. Uh, and I use this you know, as, a, as a major source of inspiration for the types of hardware architectures that, that we're building at Rain. Fantastic, fantastic. So, so many things I want to delve into there with what you've said already. Um, I know you're somebody who has probably spent more time trying to understand the brain and how it creates intelligence than almost anybody I've, I've ever met. So, I'd love to actually just start there a little bit. I think it's a unique perspective that, that we don't get often on the show. Um, from what you've studied of the brain, what are some of the aspects of the brain that make it so capable? And then maybe how does that inspire your work and, and, and the work of others in, in creating uh, intelligence in, in other systems and non-biological systems? Yeah, so I think the uh, probably the best place to start actually in, in terms of understanding the brain is actually the current state of deep learning and uh, you know, machine intelligence or AI. So we have these artificial neural networks that have, they use very simple neurons. Um, They're not, you know, complex. They basically gate signals. You know, the most commonly used neuron is a ReLU or rectified linear unit. It's just a very simple nonlinear activation function. And the connections between the neurons are simple, essentially linear transformations. So we use a matrix to transform from one layer to another. So the synapses are linear. And we use, there's, there's a very important principle that we use on top of this that views learning as optimization. So essentially what you do is you have some error function on your network. Let's say you're trying to recognize images, right? So your network takes in an image at the input and it's tasked with telling you what's in that image. Now, initially you have some data that's labeled by humans. So you have a bunch of images with labels like there's a cat in this image or there's a dog or a chair. And the network has an accuracy, so the percentage of images that it gets right or wrong, and it wants to essentially minimize the number of errors. And what we can do is we we can train, we can move the weights in a direction that decreases the number of errors that it makes. 
And this is, this is this idea of optimization. Its prediction looks more like the, the labeled correct understanding. Exactly. So if it, the, the, the dog, it, you know, the thing it thinks is a dog is closer to an actual dog. That's exactly right. And so over time, as you, as you train this network, as you move these weights, as you optimize the weights, uh, the network will get better and better at performing whatever task it's doing. Now, this is, this is quite different from the way that a lot of neuroscientists have historically thought about learning. But it turns out to be extremely powerful in this idea of learning as optimizing the weights, as optimizing the weights of the neural network is, in my opinion, this is the, the way to think about how brains work. So we can get back to, you know, the artificial neural networks are very simple things, you know, uh, relatively speaking, compared to biological networks. But just these few principles, you know, really gets at the core of what I think is happening now. There's a problem in that the way we do optimization in these artificial neural networks is incompatible with biological neural networks. And that's because this algorithm that's used called backpropagation that we use to optimize these artificial neural networks can't be used to optimize biological neural networks. So I think the, the main problem, the most important problem in figuring out how brains are really working is finding out how are they doing optimization? How are biological brains doing optimization? Like what algorithm are they using? Because they can't be using backpropagation. But clearly, in my opinion at least, they're doing something very similar. So finding out what that is, is the focus of a, of a lot of the, you know, Yashua Bengio and Jeff Hinton, all these top names in, in AI, they're very interested in this problem. Just a question there. You, you know, we kind of started with how does the brain work and you jump pretty quickly into neural networks, the artificial kind or, uh, you know, artificial neural networks. Um, and you'll hear quite a few experts or, or people in the field say things like, hey, this was inspired by the brain, but it's nothing like it. You'll hear it. They'll, they'll even put emphasis on it. They'll say it's absolutely nothing like it. Um, what are your thoughts on how closely this model maps to what is going on in the brain? Is it your understanding that it is actually a lot closer than people realize? And if, if that's the case, what do you think you see that, that you know some of these other people in the industry don't see? So I think that when people say that, they're usually referring to human intelligence, the human brain. And I'll make no comment about the human brain because it's clear that neocortex is doing something very complicated. However, I think if you look at insect brains and very primitive brains, I believe that what's happening in deep neural networks, there seems to be this, uh, this magical synergy between the structure of a deep neural network Right? The way that all deep neural networks, even the ones in insects or human brains, right? the way that they're structured and this optimization process that I mentioned, this is something called stochastic gradient descent. There's this synergy there that is so striking and unexpected that to me, it says something about, it says that this has to be what at least primitive brains are doing. So I think that people people have said that for a long time. People have said, "Oh, this is, you know, they're inspired by, you know, brains, but there there's nothing like that going on in real brains." I think that the core elements that make deep learning work are actually what's happening in primitive brains. Like I said though, the algorithm that's being used back propagation to accomplish that task, I think is different, but the underlying principles I think are are the same. Fascinating, fascinating, and 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 we'll definitely um maybe ask you to share some some resources because I know you've shared some fantastic resources with me in the past on on this topic and it's a very deep topic so um, we won't try to get to the bottom of it today but it's fascinating that you see those parallels and and obviously that has implications for how we build these intelligences if we think some of the core components of these systems map to what we see in biological intelligence then they give us more hope that we are on the path to achieving the general intelligence that the biological systems have as well. Yeah. Fascinating, fascinating. Jack, I'd love to get your perspective on how would you describe the current 
capabilities and limit limitations of general AI systems. So we're not talking about super narrow stuff. We're not talking about, you know, expert systems that can play chess really, really right. well or some other very narrow. We're talking about the more general systems that are out there. Mm-hmm. Um, where do you think they're at in their capabilities and limitations today? Yeah, so I'll say that uh, all of our best, uh, you know, AI systems right now are based on neural networks. Uh, and all the really advanced things that you see, like uh, ChatGPT and Dolly 2, Stable Diffusion, um, these fascinating image generating uh, networks, they're all based on on neural networks. Now, neural networks in general right now, they're very good at pattern recognition and pattern completion. They can, and this is not something that's been possible before, right? But they can model the statistics of complex systems very well. And what I mean by that is if you have some, you know, data set, let's say it's, let's say it's uh, speech, right? Language, natural language, right? And you have a, you know, a block of text, you know, let's say you have a paragraph and you delete a few words from that paragraph, right? There are certain probabilities of different words occurring in those deleted sections. And right, because it's, because it's know, not random. There's yeah, some, exactly. There's a rhyme and reason to the way we speak. Exactly. And as a child, you learn, you know, context clues. If you don't know what a word means, you look around the word to try and get an idea of what that word means. And these machines, these neural networks are doing something very similar. They're trying to model and predict the the missing data, right? And they learn to generate and impute that data or at least predict um, what it could be. Right. And they're and more very, than, very more than just uh, more than just fill a blank, but yeah. give me sentences and paragraphs yeah. and essays. Of this so word. once you can predict one word, right, you can use that word as your new, you know, Next is your new right, data you set, and then chaining, predict the next chaining. exactly, and so you can chain right. these together, and that's how these systems are able to generate, you know, paragraphs and paragraphs of of realistic text. Um, how does now, that how does that map? I think um, we hear a lot about Chat GPT, and and so we hear a lot about that kind of token generation, the 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 kind of next most probable word. How did these um, uh, visual networks that the the dollies of the world work yeah so they do the same thing right you take images and so this by the way this uh this is a very important concept in in deep learning right now and it's called self-supervised learning and basically what it means is that you no longer need humans to go out and label a bunch of data right you can take data and you can just remove portions of it and ask the machine to fill in the blanks and in images, all you have to do is take a natural image, right, for instance, and remove a portion of that image. And, or take two, you know, you can take two crops from the same image, and you can ask the network, do these two crops belong to the same image, or do they belong to different images, right? And this is a way for these machines to learn about the structure of the data, again, the statistics of the underlying data without having to label anything. And this idea is super powerful because you can train it on enormous amounts of data scraped from the internet. Yeah, and I guess at the end of the day, from the for the purposes of the algorithm, a token is a token is a token, mm-hmm. whether it's yeah. guess the color value or guess the word, yeah. as long as there's some statistical pattern to them and they that can, they can do something that itself is remarkable because that's the same that's the property of the neocortex of the human brain mm. it got me interested in ai right in, in right. the brain and what is, what is yeah exactly what is that the property? neocortex is the wrinkly part of the brain it's the part on the outside <laughs> it's it's the part that controls basically all of humans higher level functions right you have vision and working memory and you know, planning and goal-oriented behavior. That's all. That all takes place in the neocortex, and it has this property that you can. It looks the same everywhere, right? Neocortex, roughly speaking, right? Roughly speaking, 
it looks the same everywhere. And it seems that the only thing that makes, for instance, the vision processing region of the brain, which is back here, different from the auditory processing part of the brain, which is right here, is that one part receives visual input and the other part receives auditory input, right? But the same structure, it's like this universal information processing system, right? And that was like a holy grail for a long time. And we've kind of reached that point without, I don't know, there ha there hasn't been enough of a fanfare about this in my opinion. Right, enough except, uh, excitement about deal. just how magical this is. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen some very um, interesting experiments on this exact point. You know, there's this whole question of how much of the brain is a blank slate, you know, how plastic is it able to, to kind of, and um, I, I remember reading about some experiment where they mapped, you know, some of the, the inputs that would normally have gone into the visual cortex into the auditory cortex. You're probably very familiar with this, but it was mind blowing when I saw it this, mind -blowing. you know, into the auditory cortex and lo and behold, you can see, you know, there are examples of being able to create vision that way. I think from memory, it was not as good. So there must be some level of specialization or, or, uh, or going on there, but it was, it was capable. So there is some level, significant level of plasticity in the brain, even if it's not necessarily unlimited, even if there is some specialization in the brain. Exactly. So that's very interesting. Um, and I guess maybe the specialization is, is a little bit analogous to the fine tuning and the, the, you know, the, the, the hyperparameters, you know, the, the fact that people change their neural nets to look a little bit different for language versus images versus one goal versus a different goal. So exactly. There's some parallels there as well. Fantastic. So we talked a lot about the current capabilities and how they're doing it. Um, what do you consider some of the limitations of these current general AI systems? You know, what stops them being more powerful and more capable? Yep. So... So as I mentioned, um, right now, these systems are very good at pat modeling patterns, right? They're not just good at, it's, I, I hesitate, a lot of people use the word, like, they're just good at pattern matching, or they're just pattern recognition systems. I think that that's a little, it doesn't quite capture what they're doing, right? What they're really doing is they're modeling the data itself, right? And that data is extremely complex, right? It's a very complex set of data. It's very high dimensional. And the fact that they're able to model that, um, and there's, it's funny because there's a lot of, it's all kind of geometry. If you really, if you really <laughs> think deep enough into it, this concept of manifolds and, and things like that. Um, but really they're modeling the data itself. And I think that that's very fundamental. It's like the first step that you need to start from if you want to do anything else, right? So just saying that they're doing pattern recognition, I think is, is a little misleading. Now, what they're, what they're really missing, and I'll say also right now, one of the new capabilities is the ability to mix multiple modalities, right? To be able to train on language and images, for instance. And this is like what Dolly 2 and these other um, image generators do. You can type in natural language, it understands the natural language, and then it generates an image of that system. So that's also a new capability. And this is possible due to the transformer architecture. So this is an attention-based architecture that's been state-of-the-art since around 2017, plus this idea of self-supervised learning. Right. So these two have really unlocked that. Now, the thing that's really missing is, I think, causal inference, the ability to, to understand causal structure. Because right now, these systems, they're modeling just the statistics of what you observe, right? And we know from, from what we know about causal reasoning, um, you have to be able to interact with the system and perform what's called interventions on a system in order to understand how the underlying structure of the thing that generated the data works. So I'll give you an example, right? These systems can model natural images, but they don't know anything about the way that those images were generated, right? 
they don't know anything about the fact that there's a there's a real physical world that is in you know three dimensions and has you know objects with certain properties that is actually doing the the generating of the data itself right and so without the ability to intervene in that physical world to move things around and drop objects and play with rotation and lighting and things like that they're missing they're missing key information about the causal structure of that this system. is this is so fascinating yeah because i always i get a little bit hesitant when people say things like um they don't know about the world because you can know about the world by looking at it you know um i may have never gone to niagara falls but i know what it looks like and i know there's water falling now i'm i have the the big hack of i've been in the real world otherwise so it's not exactly the same but but you can do things that way um and observing the world can make you understand something about the patterns including the certain pattern known as cause and effect that you know every time i saw a a sentence about a person touching a fire they always felt like they had you know negative sentiment out the other side some something about those patterns but you're right one thing that these systems just absolutely cannot do which we heavily rely on from a learning perspective is is intervention and interaction um, i'm just in my head by the way i'm just imagining like a uh, small child or like a cave person putting their hand in the fire going ow that hurt and then doing it one more time just to see if the, the the cause and effect was what they thought it was that it was hand in fire and not the fact that that you know a person was walking behind them at that time um that's really really fascinating okay so please go on I, i'd love to hear more about these um causal causal networks and, and how they might be a part of the future so so actually i i want to if i can do this i would like to shout out a book on Please. Uh, causal inference. Um, so this is by Yuda Pearl. I hope I'm pronouncing his first name correctly. Um, but the book is called The Book of Why. And this is basically the inventor of the current framework that we understand causal inference from. And this is called causal calculus or the two calculus. And he goes into great detail on the limitations of purely observational learning and how in order to gain a true causal reasoning to build causal models you have to be able to perform interventions and how this is affected science this current you know um, system of understanding causal inferences affected science and it's very fascinating it's got a lot of very good practical examples um so how do we bake this into our neural networks a lot of people are, are working on causal models right that have intervention as part of the um, part of the the model definition and causal structure as part of the model definition now i think that this might not be necessary because you're talking is, about kind of more experimental models you're not talking about that's in some of these exactly these none of these are really practical or widely deployed right now uh, it's very much in its infancy. Now, I think that there might be an easier way to do this, and I'd like to actually use ChatGPT as an example. So there was this paper that was put out uh, by DeepMind in 2018, I think, and it essentially showed that reinforcement learning systems are actually... in. To define reinforcement learning real quick, um, you have a system that is put in an environment and that system is able to act in the environment. And so since it's able to act and interact with the environment, it's able to perform interventions essentially, right? And it receives reward based on whether it's doing you know, something right or it's doing something wrong. So let's say you have a, you know, one of these engines was, um, one of these reinforcement learning systems was trained to play Go, right? The game Go uh, by DeepMind. And it was, you know, people thought that Go was very far out of reach until they, they built the system. But basically you give it reward if it wins a game and you, you know, give it negative reward if it doesn't win a game. So this is very similar to the dopamine system in humans. And in a lot of animals. Now, 
this DeepMind study showed that reinforcement learning systems are able to extract some causal information from the environment. So they are actually able to learn causal structure just with reinforcement learning. And we know actually a lot about reinforcement learning. So this brings me back to ChatGPT. How did they show that? You know, given how hard it is to interpret some of these models after they've learned, how did they, how were they able to show that that it those causal networks exist? So they trained them to act in environments with intrinsic causal structure. Mm, right. So you know that like this move will cause a bad outcome. You know, there's some causality that you can exactly point to in the game. exactly. And then they they basically assessed the amount of information that you would be able to get without any causal understanding, and then compared that to the amount of information that they had about the system, and they essentially showed that there was more. They they had internalized causal structure about the system. Fascinating. And, and just for those listening, you know, these reinforcement uh, learning algorithms, they're used in a, a bunch of places. And, and uh, just to give a couple of other examples that might be more familiar, uh, for any of you who are video game fans, uh, this is the same system, correct me if I'm wrong, Jack, that was used in the Dota um, uh, model used by, uh, created by OpenAI. And imagine you're playing a video game and you know that, you know, running headfirst into the baddie or the the enemy will obviously going to lose you lose you lose your points or lose your health you would quickly realize that and not do it again and and then those are the types of cause and effect mechanisms that you want these models to be able to understand about the world which is how we operate in the world too you don't keep running into the wall or keep touching the fire because you realize that's a cause and effect or, or inversely positive things you realize that when you eat a cookie you know that gives you sugar and that life is a bit better. So those kind of cause and effect networks are what we're talking about. Yep, that's exactly right. And you were about to say ChatGPT. Yeah, so so ChatGPT is actually interesting. So you might have heard about GPT-3, which is kind of the predecessor to ChatGPT. And GPT-3 is a large language model that was trained in this self-supervised fashion, like I mentioned earlier. So you give it a paragraph of text and you delete some words and you say, what are the words that are supposed to go here? And it learns the structure of language, right? Now with ChatGPT, they took that system that had this broad base of statistical knowledge about language, and then they did reinforcement learning on it. And the way that they did reinforcement learning on it is they asked it to generate, you know, five answers to a given prompt. So a human would go in and give it a prompt and it would generate five answers, and then the human would rate those answers as in like good good or bad, right? And then it would use that human feedback as a reward function, right? And it did this with a lot of, you know, human feedback, human given data. And it wasn't, it wasn't, I remember the numbers, they're not, they're, they're big, but not massive. I think it was maybe in the low thousands or something. Yeah, like I don't that. know the, I don't know the exact number, but it must have been something relatively manageable. Yeah, it was, it was, yeah, it was a number where you could imagine, you know, you could maybe even do it amongst, you know, a couple dozen people. It wasn't uh, some inordinate number. And for the record, um, it would be very much not be possible to just do the reinforcement learning from scratch to start from zero and just to do reinforcement learning because reinforcement learning turns out to be pretty inefficient in terms of learning and you know people struggled because reinforcement learning is super slow but it gives you these sort of very general capabilities The self-supervised learning stuff and this sort of purely observational learning is very fast. And only recently have we found out that really I think the way to build intelligent systems is to start by purely observational learning, self-supervised learning, learn a very good foundational model that understands the statistics of the system, of the data, and then bring in reinforcement learning on top of that. And I think the idea is that that's how you can extract causal structure from from the world. And I think that's actually what ChatGPT is starting to do with this reinforcement learning. So your your thoughts are that um, 
something like ChatGPT. Um, first, they did the self-supervised learning. And at that point, there are almost pure pattern recognition. I know that's a very hard thing to define in the world of patterns also show cause and effect. So, but they, it was mostly just doing what we understand as being pattern matching, fill the blank type logic. But as the reinforcement learning was brought in, possibly somewhere in that neural net, we're getting something like causal network, something like cause and effect understanding. And that's why even that small amount of fine tuning led to pretty significant improvements over GPT-3. I think significant is an understatement. In my <laughs> I think it's, uh, it's remarkable how much that improved the system. Sure. And I think sure. that we're seeing the birth of a new paradigm here in terms of AI training. It's interesting to me because it, to me, it also, there's just so much greenfield left. You know, what we've done is do the big um, self-supervised learning and then add a bit of reinforcement learning. But, you know, we haven't touched on what about if there was just a little bit of reinforcement learning early in its lifetime, or if those things were happening, you know, in parallel and there was something, um, you know, because again, I can't help but think about real agents in the real world, humans and animals moving through. Um, and then we haven't talked about interventions because in this case, ChatGPT couldn't really apply intervention. It couldn't ask questions of us or try things, you know, experiment with things in the way that we can. But um, a lot of those things are still possibilities yet to be yet to be fully um, tested or, or, or implemented. Totally agree. And I think, I think that it is doing a little bit of an intervention in the sense that it's saying like, you know, hey, I'm going to give you a few prompts, like which of these is best, right? right? right. And so I think that's like the first spark of that. Now, <laughs> there's another limitation that I haven't talked about yet in terms of current systems. And this is really based on the, just the speed of learning. Um, I, think, I think actually a lot of people talk about generalization capabilities and things like that. I think that will come with causal, the causal reasoning. But really the other big limitation is the speed. Uh, current AI systems learn much, much slower than uh, real brains. And it's, it's very clear that there's something that real brains have that artificial neural networks don't that makes them learn very fast. My opinion on this is, so I mentioned this idea of stochastic gradient descent. This is how the weights of the neural networks are optimized. And you can think of it as what it essentially does is it it makes a linear the it makes a linear approximation of this error function right of your of your error right and it says how do i change my weights by just a little bit to decrease that error as much as possible but it's really using a linear approximation in order in order to do that and the idea is that if you as you keep decreasing this error um, your network performance gets better and better, but you're only using a linear approximation to do that at every at every step. Right? And for, for our audience members who might be a little less mathematically inclined, what we talk about with error function is really how far are we from the correct answer? Yeah, you know, if exactly. we if the right answer was this perfect sentence and you're three words off, you know, you can you can measure that in an algorithmic way to, to say we're we're still pretty far here. Yeah, exactly. And so what what we know works much better and is in fact orders of magnitude faster per training iteration right per example that you see is something called second order optimization and in second order optimization instead of doing a linear approximation to that error surface instead of taking a line right you fit it with a line um, you fit it with a quadratic curve right and the reason that that's important is because it takes the curvature of the error surface into account. And, you know, it can curve in, by, in different amounts in different directions. And really, you want to adjust for all of those different curvatures because you want to step more in regions where it's maybe relatively flat. You can, you can move your weights a very far direction while still knowing that you're going to decrease in your error. Whereas if the curvature is very high, like this, right? Uh, maybe you have very high curvature and you're here, you don't want to step too far because if you step too far, you're going to end up you're over, over here, else. right? You want right. to just step a little bit, 
right? So you slowly move down the surface to the yeah, bottom. Yeah, and of the another earth. way to say that in in kind of plain, a bit more plain English terms would be something like you don't want to overshoot or undershoot. Yeah, you know, exactly. If you're trying to tweak, if the world actually needs a little tweak and you do a big complete change, that might not be good. And these are kind of mathematical ways of of, of uh, measuring that and and uh, optimizing for that. Yep. Yeah, you don't want to make your system unstable because if you take, if you try and learn too fast, your system can break. Essentially, uh, it can forget everything that it's learned, and you'll end up in this set of weights that's just meaningless. You know, so you want to be very careful about that. And with second order optimization, it lets you do that much more efficiently because you have a much better picture of your error function. Now, the problem with using the second order information to do learning, even though it's much faster per iteration, per uh, per example that you show the network, the second order estimate computing that takes much more computing power, like a lot more. And so in practice, it's not worth it because you might speed up the algorithm by, you know, you might require a hundred times fewer iterations to converge, but it might take a hundred times more compute power per iteration, right? And so the, it, it effectively cancels out. Now, what we what we have shown actually in, in Rain is that the the reason, well, it's well known that the reason for this cost is that instead of just doing a you know a vector matrix multiplication, this relatively simple operation, um, which is in you know the core operation for deep learning, it's how you go from one neural network layer to another neural network layer. You need to do what's called matrix inversion for these second order algorithms, right? And matrix inversion is much much more expensive than matrix multiplication. But it seems that physical systems, so like physical circuits, like real circuits, are able to do this matrix inversion for free. Right. And it's because of how this, it's because of the structure of physical systems. It's actually super interesting. So my current hypothesis right now is that neural circuits in real brains are exploiting this this natural matrix inversion. And it's, it basically has to do with, if you look at circuits, the relationship, there's a duality between voltage and current and these concepts of admittance and impedance, basically how electricity flows through networks. And I think that this is, they're doing this matrix inversion for free in order to get fast second order estimates. And that's how biological brains are able to learn so much faster. They get this 100x, you know, or 1000x speed up because they're doing second order optimization. But each step of that second order optimization is extremely fast, right? Because they're exploiting this matrix inversion. There's, there's an optimization we could do in how we learn and in biological and potentially other um, kind of analog or, or, or uh, other kind of physical systems we could potentially create, they can be very cheap. And that's what the brain is using. But our current uh, digital architectures, the current digital hardware architectures don't allow for this to be cheap. Therefore, we're dramatically less efficient than That is than, exactly than correct. Yep. Fascinating, fascinating, fascinating. And is is this related now to the work that you're doing at Rain, and and then does does your does the 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 hardware that you're developing solve for this challenge? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so this is a relatively recent research topic for us, so it's still early, um, but we have some preliminary results on this, and it's it's very exciting. Fantastic, fantastic. Why have you chosen to focus your energy on the hardware portion? Um, What's what's so special? Is it is it just what we spoke about now? Is there more to it? Why focus on that area for, for your work? So I made this choice quite a long time ago, actually. Uh, so this was around 2013. And AlexNet had just happened and I saw, you know, deep learning sort of rising to it was the very early days of deep learning becoming popularized. And I was very inspired by it. And my background happened to be in 
physics and I was doing chemical engineering and physics in my undergrad. And I understood physical systems and I wanted to tackle things from that perspective. As, as I learned about the brain, it was clear to me that there are constraints on the brain because the brain is a physical system. It's like, as I mentioned earlier, that we know that the brain can't be doing the backpropagation algorithm, which is how we train modern deep neural networks. And the reason that it can't, we know that it can't use the backpropagation algorithm is because of the physics. This is because of physical constraints of locality and the fact that you can't, ex- you can't exactly know in deep learning, you have to know the exact precise network structure, right? But in the brain, one region of the brain doesn't have exact knowledge of any other region of the brain. It has to sort of treat any other region as kind of a black box to some extent. Um, and that's, I think that's actually really fundamental. And so really it was... And then, so understanding the physical structure of the brain and why that's important was a big was a big part of it. But then the other part was, I saw modern computers as the limiting factor. You know, we just can't build neural networks that are the same size and scale as the human brain. And so, until we can do that, that'll probably be a bottleneck. And so that's that's part of the reason why I decided to do hardware. I would love to see a visual or or something around physical dimensions around what it took to train something like a chat gpt and really what took to chat you know i'm talking gpt3 and anything else it used as a as a um as a model as an input into it because yeah it's i'm guessing it wasn't the size of uh two fists you know a brain size i think it's about a factor of a million difference a million you know the power capacity efficiency of real brains and you know chat gpt a million. Okay. Yeah. We've got a few zeros to lop off. Yep. Um, fascinating. <laughs> fascinating. There's a long way to go. Yeah. So um, this has been a fascinating first part of the conversation, just trying to understand kind of where we're at and what, what, what makes it good, what makes it work and what makes it not work. Um, I'd love to get um, your perspective on where do you think the next decade or so is going to take us? Um where do you think these systems are headed? You know, if we if we wake up in say twenty thirty or twenty thirty five, how far? How you know? Yeah, where where do you think these systems are headed in the next decade or so? So, I think that with with Chat GPT, I'm quite I'm quite excited about Chat GPT. A lot of people have focused on you know the limitations of it, but I really think it is a massive step forward, and it's just a prototype, and you know, I think with a few more iterations, it'll be something that can really, I think it's the first thing that I have gotten the gut reaction of like, I think this might be able to replace Google search. And I have never thought anything about that. Well, before. Go- go- Google agrees with you. Because, uh, <laughs> I know. <laughs> they've, they've initiated uh, Code Red and all these other things. Oh, yeah. and, and Microsoft oh, yeah. just interacted. Yeah. So they're, in the search community, I think there are some people who agree with you. Yeah. So, um, on the other hand, I think it's just the beginning, you know, I think, uh, in the next, my opinion is that within the next few years, we'll see something like, uh, an AGI emerge. And I want to, I want to be careful about how I say AGI because some people, usually skeptics have shifted the goalpost a little bit of AGI to mean like human-like or human-level intelligence. I don't think that's what AGI is, right? AGI is precisely what it says. It's a general intelligence. I think that a general intelligence is something that is able to process multiple modalities of data, any any arbitrary modality of data, right? That's a big part of what I think the word general means. Mm, um, okay. So you can feed yeah, so in... It can't, just, it can't be just text. Exactly. It can't be just text. So you know, vision, speech, I think motor control is something that's missing right now. Um, So it should be able to handle something like motor control as well. And it should have a causal understanding of the data as well. I think that's another big piece. And once you have the causal understanding of the data, 
I should say the data generating process, right? The thing that generated the data, because that's really what you what's missing, I think, in between you know what systems currently have right now, which is sort of statistical understanding of the data versus what we need, which is an under a causal understanding of the mechanisms that generated the data, right? And that's what humans have, right? And that's really what I think understand. What we, what we might call the world in yeah, human exactly. terms. <laughs> they have to have an understanding of the world that it's it's inhabiting. Yep. And then I think another one is the another big one is the ability to use prior knowledge to learn new things faster. Right. And I think that that is like to apply previous experience to new unknown situations and be able to handle them more effectively by leveraging that prior experience. In my opinion, those are the three things that really would make uh, a generally intelligent system. And that is what I think that we'll, we'll reach within probably the span of a few years now. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think uh, you could argue that by those definitions, ChatGPT is not far off. It's know, not it, far. It, I don't think yeah, it quite meets far. those specs, no. but no. We're, we're close. Yes. And what about um, AGI as others define it? Um, it has taken on as the kind of the more popular definition of something much more capable, something at least approaching human level capabilities you know it can either move in the physical or digital world or both and it can you know have goals and and and, and pursue those goals and and have a a real capability to kind of reason and, and act in that world is that something you see us reaching in the coming decades yes i think uh right now we are hardware limited for that Um, And so what I think is going to happen is we're going to create relatively general systems in the next few years, right? Something that I think we're going to solve, you know, motor control for one. And I think we're also going to solve this, uh, this idea of sort of more causal imbuing these models with more, at least more causal understanding of of the world. And then we're going to plateau. And I think the reason that we're going to plateau is Moore's law is dead, and despite what Intel, you know, has to say, plug in their ears and screaming, no, 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 you know, forty more years of more, um, it's unfortunately here, and you only need to ask the CEO of Nvidia, you know, because he he publicly proclaimed proclaimed that uh, Moore's law is dead, which was a big, that was a big deal actually for him to say that, and he's trying to caution consumers you know he's trying to you know let people know that we're not going to be seeing the same gains that we've seen in the past and as a as a very concrete piece of example sram scaling has ended right and sram is you know it's what's used for like cache memory and cpus and um it's kind of like the uh it's the it's also used in a lot of AI accelerators as well. So it's kind of the, in my opinion, like the most important memory uh, for modern computers. Um, it has stopped scaling. We can't make them in smaller anymore, right? And so that's a big problem. Uh, so there are other things. Now, Moore's law isn't synonymous with computing power, right? Moore's law just says specifically and precisely that the number of transistors that you can fit on a chip doubles every 18 months, right? That is no longer true uh, going forward. So that's where we've gotten most of the scaling from. Now, there are other things that we can do like 3D packaging and integration and and stuff like that. Um, But we're definitely going to see a plateau and and a big slowdown. These exponential gains that we've been getting over the past 70 years or something like that, um, it's not going to be there anymore. Right. We're going to need more paradigm shifts of some kind, whether it's in the hardware, the software, or both. There needs to be a paradigm shift in the in the way that we build hardware, specifically for neural networks, right? And there's ample room for that, but it's going to take a little while. 
for it. Right, it's not up. as it's not a it's not a click a button and deploy. It takes a bit more time. I mean, uh, I've heard people say things like um, modern semiconductor industries and, and and fabrication factories are the most advanced things we've ever created in the sense of how much capex and human effort and knowledge and and and, and uh, the best human knowledge has gone into it. So it's going to take a little while to start from somewhere else on the on the spec, you know, on the on the curve and, and build that optimization back up. Yeah, exactly. And so at the same time, too, like the the pace of progress in AI models. So Moore's law, right, predicts like doubling improvement every 18 months or so, right? AI models have been doubling every three and a half months, which is astronomical. It's beyond astronomical. It's uh, it's kind of it's staggering how fast. And by doubling here, you're training. talking at the parameter sizes. Exactly. Like the largest models that we can build and train effectively. Now, <laughs> obviously, you can't just, like, that's not just due to increased computing power, right? The biggest reason is because they've been scaling out data centers, right? They've been putting more and more of these chips together and just scaling the infrastructure. Now, I think a lot of people in the deep learning community, they kind of just expect that to continue into the future. Um, but we're very soon going to see the limit of that scaling, scaling out, right? And in combination, you know, we're on this three and a half month exponential doubling period, right? Us hitting the limit of scaling infrastructure plus Moore's law ending is going to mean a very sharp plateau in compute power, right? The amount of compute that we can throw at these networks, which has been how these networks have been improving in performance. And I think that's going to be kind of a shock and a wake up call to a lot of people in the deep learning community. And so there's going to be a, a lull. But then I think that's going, to, that's going to push people to start making things more efficient. Architectures, algorithms more efficient, squeezing more out of the compute power that we have. I think that's ultimately going to be beneficial, more beneficial than just increasing the amount of compute that we throw at these networks. So that's, what I, that's how I see the, the future going. We're going to hit these relatively general systems. Things will plateau for a little while, and then new hardware is going to come out that just you know it's going to be another you know exponential uptick and that's when after that is when we're going to see human level ai so how long that plateau lasts i'm not sure but maybe five years maybe 10 years right and people talk about this in the context of all technology that actually when you see a big exponential curve over decades and decades and centuries actually it's lots of little s curves you, know, <laughs> yeah. you you invent something it gets optimized and you use it up and then you have to invent something new or something built on top of it um and and, and that's been the history of technology in in every every sense so that's really fascinating you expect a big still a few more years of, of really exciting um, of improvements in the generality and capabilities then an s curve then a flattening essentially um, before we need a bit of a bit more breakthroughs on the hardware side and and by the way I was looking at some of this stuff in in preparation for this interview it's not like there's a uh, a small amount of, of people working on the hardware side, uh, rain, rain being one of them. So people are already working on this because they, others see this as well and people recognize the gaps here. Yep, definitely. Yeah, but I do think that it is going to need a, a fundamental shift in the way that we do computation for these, for these neural networks. And that might, you know, to reach the same scale as the current AI infrastructure with GPUs, to reach that level of scale, I think that's going to take a little while. Do you see AGI systems that parallel or, or, or rival human level, and rival is the wrong word because I'm not saying they're necessarily rivals, but in terms of they match um, human level capabilities in our lifetimes? Is this oh, something? Oh, that's absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I think it's like 15 years, uh, but you know, we'll see. Fascinating. Maybe it's fascinating. Yeah. yeah, that makes sense. So... How do you think um, this is now moving past timelines and pathways? Just a little bit, I want to get your take, Jack, on some of the implications and, 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 and outcomes. We develop these types of intelligent systems. 
Um, they're getting more and more capable on the order of you know a couple of decades. How do you think that affects our world? Do you think do you see it being a positive development? Do you you know how do you think that plays out? That's a great question, and uh, I wish more people were were thinking about this. You know, a lot of uh, you know my colleagues in the industry, um, AI researchers. I think they're very nonchalant with uh, with AI and in the future developments of AGI, and you know they think because we're a very far way away from you know human level AI, you know they kind of dismiss a lot of the existential risks. I'm a little bit more cautious. Um, like, not gonna lie, when I first saw ChatGPT, it scared me a little. You know, that was my first reaction. I was like, oh, sh- crap. This is going to be, you know, this is a can of worms. And right. so... It's quite, um, it's quite the Pandora's box. Yeah, yeah, in terms of generating misinformation and deception. and So I think that um, there are certainly reasons to be cautious about it. At the same time, I am I am very optimistic about the the good uses of it um i think probably the best example is AlphaFold. you know DeepMind built this um built this ai the system that was able to solve like a, a generational problem in biology right this was like the most i hesitate to say but it's probably the most important open problem in biology which is Given an amino acid sequence, given like, you know, uh, a sequence of DNA, for instance, right, that gets translated to an amino acid sequence that encodes proteins, right? And we can, we can know, we know the sequence, right? Because we can read it off the genome. But we have no idea how a sequence of amino acids will fold into a particular protein structure. And it turns out that the way that that protein is folded in 3D space, right, going from a chain into a, an actual protein, uh, that totally determines its function, right? Right. What it it's does. massively important. Yeah. yeah. And so, like the little, you know, cellular motors and things that we have, the things that replicate our, our DNA, right? All of those proteins, like their operation, like what they do is determined by essentially their shape and what different. You know, amino acids are located in. Well, I mean, it's 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 all of life. You yeah, know, exactly. all of life is built so on these proteins. Yeah, exactly. It's how life fundamentally operates. It's these little nano machines, right? And for the first time, we can predict um, how these proteins will fold. Amazing. Because it was, Amazing. you know, it was essentially an exponentially hard problem before. Uh, it was the difficulty of trying to brute force this problem is difficult to to overstate um but yeah these these neural networks can can do that can predict the protein structures very accurately now that opens huge doors in medicine um like almost all illnesses a lot of illnesses of the body that are currently unsolved boil down to some type of protein dysfunction or malfunction or can be fixed or improved by designing proteins. Not to mention, like, we, a lot of people were very excited about nanotechnology for a long time, right? including myself. That's why actually why I study chemical engineering and physics. Um, but real nanotechnology, like making little nanorobots, you know, that was not possible. And really, if you think about it, the ability to design proteins that have a certain shape and function is going to be the foundation of the, what I think is going to be a revolution in nanote- nanotechnology. Right. So we may have seen one of our earliest, earliest kind of AGI type, sorry, AGI is the wrong word, uh, more general AI systems or, or advanced AI systems figure out one of the hardest problems in biology and with possibly massive implications for yeah. medicine, you know, materials, anywhere Exactly. nano fuels anyway nanotechnology can be applied so and by the way this has just happened i i haven't seen i think this is one other one that hasn't received the level of fanfare that's uh, necessary and i think it's partially because people still don't know what to make of it and how to yeah. use it because for so long 
proteins have been something you could only study by watching them do what they do rather than actually understand the cause and effect of, of protein interaction. So um, I think this is something we're going to hear a lot more about in the coming years as people make sense of it. Absolutely. So yeah, so that's a really big one. I mean, there are, there are all kinds of systems that are being built right now that you know improve lives. I mean, even even Chat GPT, like one of the one of the big uses um, is translation, right? And and not just translation in just sort of a direct translation way, but you know, if you have somebody who only speaks Spanish or or has trouble speaking English. And they want to write an important email, you know, because they're applying for a job or something like that. Um, they can work with ChatGPT to craft, to translate, you know, a few bullet points in Spanish into an email in Spanish and then just translate that into English. It can do all of that. And so I think there are a lot of ways that even these language models are going to be improving people's lives. At the same time, you have the sort of, you know, some of the more negative uh, aspects like deep fakes, right? And so I think we need to pour a significant amount of resources into, like, into countermeasures, basically, into detecting deep fakes. You know, just like AI systems can be used to generate deep fakes, you can use AI systems to detect them as well. So. Absolutely. Yeah. And the piece about language is a fascinating one because you think about, and again, this is why, you know, technology is so hard to predict because these effects are, are really, they build on each other and they can, they can affect you in ways you don't understand. For example, if, if all of a sudden all of us had an earpiece that let us speak every language in the world, you know, think about how much human misery and uh, conflict is caused by poor communication and, and not understanding someone. Um, imagine being able to walk into another country and have perfect crystal clear communication with them, what that would change about our connections with people around the world. Um, yeah, these, these kinds of big effects are hard to predict. And once they come about, only then can we really reason about them. But, but I think you're absolutely right that there's um, positive and not so positive things that can come out of this. And that's where we need to pay our attention as, as these things get more capable and, and ahead of that if, if possible. And I just want to ask you, Jack, is there any other comments, suggestions, thoughts that you'd have for our listeners? And our listeners are a mix of, of technical people and policymakers, others deeply interested in the world of general AI systems and how they might be developed and, and, and impact our world. Do you have any comments or thoughts for our listeners? Yeah, so I really think that uh, we're going to be in for, for a wild ride in the next few years. So we should buckle up. Uh, you know, AI is going to be as impactful as the internet. And like, we know how much the internet changed the world. We're still dealing with ramifications of the internet. And so AI on top of that, you know, we're going to have a lot to, to deal with. Like the internet, there's going to be good things and bad things. And so I think what we need right now is a few things. One, I really think that the scientific community needs to come together with the tech giants who are the ones who have the resources to build these massive models like OpenAI, DeepMind, Google. Um, so the scientific community, these tech giants and policymakers need to come together and reach a consensus on what's okay to build and what's not okay to build. I really think that's something that needs to happen now, especially with ChatGPT coming out. We need to focus on the good applications, right? Like, I think that's something that all of us AI researchers at least can do. Try and do as much good as possible and focus on countermeasures, right? Focus on creating deep fake detectors, focus on identifying misinformation, you know, prevent, you know, bad outcomes from happening. At least put energy into that. Absolutely. And if you're not a member of the AI research community, at least, you know, try to bring it into the conversation elect politicians who understand this stuff. I think Andrew Yang was a good example. I'm not arguing for UBI or anything like that, but he <laughs> certainly was somebody who discussed AI as an important part of, you know, the next decade. 
And so I think we need politicians who understand it as well. Fascinating. Fascinating. You're right. The technical literacy of some of our leaders has, has been a something that's been a, a gap for a long time. And this is only going to make that problem worse if we don't face into it and do something about it. Fantastic. Fantastic. Jack, that's that's really incredible. Um, thank you so much, Jack, for, for all your time. I learned so much. And Thank uh, you, Suresh, for having me. Really, really appreciate it. Yeah, honestly, it I, I, I'm, I'm tempted to make this a three-hour podcast, but we'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll leave that for other um, episodes. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, everybody, for listening, and we'll, he, we'll be with you next time. Thank you. Thanks.